Hey, up my duck YouTube. Today I am with a video idea which I've just come up with a couple of weeks ago about what would happen if where your manager started their career, they couldn't move from there. So I'm going to go through every single Premier League club's manager I could find who did that. There is one club who, the last time that happened, the, the manager has died. We'll come to that when it comes around. Also, news just in, Derby County, my team, has just signed Nathan Byrne. Good signing. So, see what he can do for us. I think he was captain of Wigan. But let's get straight into this with Liverpool. And the last time they had a manager who started at their club was Kenny Dalaglish. Now, he's he's all, he's all right. He's, uh, I think he's in his 60s now. Um, he came in to begin with after the Hayshaw um, Stadium disaster and became a bit a player manager. Uh, he actually, in his first season, guided the club to the first double of Liverpool. Uh, they won the league championship by two points over the rivals of Everton. Funny and ironically enough, Dalglish actually scored the winner over Chelsea at uh, Stamford Bridge to win this season. And they also won the FA Cup by beating Everton as well. So all a bit local rivalry there. Um, and then the next season, they were trophyless as they lost the League Cup final to Arsenal 2-1. Uh, in 1987-88, Dalglish signed two players of... Uh, Peter Beardsley from Newcastle and John Barnes from Watford, as well as goalkeeper John Aldridge from Oxford United to replace Ian Rush. Um, into the new campaign, he also bought Ray Hooten. Uh, so the new look of Liverpool, shaped by Dalglish, um, topped the league for almost the entire season. Uh, they had a run of 37 matches unbeaten in all competitions. From the beginning of the season to the 21st of February, when they lost to Everton. They were crown champions with four games left to play, having suffered just two defeats in 40 games. They did lose the FA Cup in 1988 to the underdogs of Wimbledon. In the summer of 1988, Ian Rush came back to Liverpool and they beat Everton in extra time in a second all-Merseyside FA Cup final affair in 1989. But they were deprived of a second double in the final game of the season when Arsenal scored a last-minute goal to take the title away. Uh, in 1989-90 season, Liverpool won their third league title under Dalglish. They missed out on the double and a third successive FA Cup final appearance when they lost an extra time to Crystal Palace at Villa Park. Uh, in a semi-final, sorry, at Villa Park. Uh, at the end of the season, he received the third Manager of the Year award. He then resigned in 1991, two days after a four-all draw with rivals Everton in the FA Cup fifth round. Um, uh, at the time of his resignation, the club were three points ahead in the league and still in contention for the FA Cup, so it's a bit... But a bit strange. Um, it could be the fact that he was manager at the time of the Hillsborough disaster. So that could have been an influential factor, almost certainly was. He did then return um, in 2009. Um, he was made club ambassador. Um, so, and in July, I think. Um, Roy Hodgson was appointed in his place. Uh, but poor on the results in 2010-11. Made fans call for Dalglish to return. Um, Hodgson left and he was appointed caretaker manager on the 8th of January 2011. Uh, for his first game was against Man United in the third round of the FA Cup, which they lost. The first league game was against Blackpool, which they lost. Uh, he did believe that he had a big challenge on his hands. He did indicate though that he would like the club on a permanent basis, and it was offered to him. Um, so the club owned, and um, so yeah, this is basically when he, he signed 
Andy Carroll for a re British record transfer fee of 35 million. He brought Luis Suarez in. Um, he was trying to assert his authority at the club, I think, is what was probably trying to happen. He then won against Chelsea. Um, and yeah, so he had been given a three year contract by 2011. His first official match in charge was a defeat to Harry Radnapp's Spurs at Anfield. Uh, his second stint at Anfield proved to be quite controversial as the Scot defended Luis Suarez in the wake of the striker's eighth match ban for racially abusing Manchester United and Patrice Evra when the teams met in October 2011 after the Uruguayans' apparent refusal to shake Evra's hands in return fixture in February 2012. An apology from both players and manager came out after the intervention from the owners. And then Dalglish led Liverpool to the first trophy in six years, winning the 2011-12 EFL Cup, and also led to the 2012 FA Cup final, which they then turned off to Chelsea. But they did finish eighth in the league, which was their worst finish in the league since 1994, failing to qualify for the Champions League in the third straight season. So he was sacked. And yes, yeah, so that was Kenny Dalglish at Liverpool. On to Man City. Have to go fairly far back for Man City. And it was actually Peter Reed. So Peter Reed, many of you will know him from a certain generation, but if I'm right in thinking, please let me know if I wasn't. But he, he did go on to manage a few of the teams. But um, he only began in the 7th of November 1990 as care manager and then appointed player manager on a permanent contact in the 15th of November of 1990. Uh, in that season, they finished 5th, one place above Manchester United and equaled the achievement for the following season, which was the first season of Premier League, if you know your history. However, they slipped into ninth with their long ball style of football, and Sir Reed was sacked. Um, although he did bring in Keith Curley and Terry Fellon for two and a half million each, and sold Colin Hendry, who was replaced by Michael Vonk, and Clive Allen was also sold. So he didn't have the most successful time as a manager. I, he was better later on. I think he wasn't a straight instant success as Kenny Dalglish was. The third one, you can argue with me about this because it, he did start as a reserve team for Manchester United and then came back many years later. It is Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. Um, well, it's fairly obvious uh, from what you can see this season. He's clearly got his credits. He finished third. So um, I'm not really going to cover his season. Um, should I cover his season or not? Um, I can do. He signed in the 31st of March 2006 to develop his coaching award uh, and asked to do as an ambassador, travelled to Hong Kong and set up a school of Manchester United Soft School in Hong Kong. Um, he would then train to be a coach, earning his badges from Manchester United. Um, he then worked for Ferguson at Old Trafford, coaching strikers for the remainder of the 2008 season. He then took over Manchester United Reserves in the summer 2008 um, and was United's first full reserve team manager since 2006, taking over Brian McClare and Jeremy Ryan, uh, who had filled in the roles of a caretaker capacity. He won the 2007-8 Lancashire Senior Cup by defeating the Liverpool Reserves, uh, won his first Manchester Senior Cup by defeating Bolton Wanderers, um, and then he left for mould. I think that's how you announce it. Uh, he then was appointed caretaker manager in 2018, 
taking over Jose Mourinho for the rest of the season. He was going to return for Molden in 2019 in the May of that year. But um, for assistant coach Erling Moe, acting as caretaker manager in Solskjaer's absent in the preseason and first matches of the 2019 Eletrian, um, he would need to sign a new contract with Mould if he was to return. But this was refuted and he expected Solskjaer to return. It was all a bit controversial, really. Um, his first match. Uh, um, back and as first team manager was against Cardiff City, which he won 5 1 quite convincingly, which was the first time they actually scored more than five Premier League goals since they drew with West Brom Albion in Ferguson's final game in charge before retirement. Um, so yeah, he won his first five league games in charge, which has not been done since Matt Busby. Um, and then it, it was extended to six, eight in all competitions. I think I understand why they gave him permanent after he got Premier League manager of a month. Um, but yeah, the Champions League saw Solskjaer suffer his first loss as a manager. He lost at home to PSG in the round of 16. But um, a lot of people don't seem to like him at Manchester United. I don't think he's... Bad. He has lost the semi-finals of the FA Cup, the FA Cup, and the Europa League. But I think if you have faith, faith, faith in him, he will produce the goal. Uh, Graham Ricks, interestingly enough, is Chelsea's first manager. Um, again, I think I can confirm by most fans that he was probably a bit better as a player than a caretaker manager. Um, he joined as a youth team coach in mid-1993, and during an injury crisis, he became a player, playing one game in 1995 against his also at Arsenal. He then became assistant in 1996 under Rude Gullit, and continued as Gullit's successor, under Gullit's successor, Gialanka Viali winning the FA Cup in 1997 and the League Cup and Cup Winners Cup in 1998. He won the FA Cup again in 2007 before leaving the club after he had a brief spell as caretaker manager following Viali's sacking by Ken Bates. So he was only really a caretaker manager. You can't really buy too much into that. Most of these were. There was then the joint managers of Mike Stowell and Adam Sadler. Um... I think both were caretakers at the time. Don't think they were really meant to be joint managers. Um, yeah, not really. Um, yeah, both him. They only, I think it was only one game or something, which was a 2 1 win over Brighton and Hove. Um, and it was a win. It's a 100% record. They only had one game in charge of a club. You can't argue with it, though. Um, Stowell spent most of his time as a goalkeeping coach and assistant manager. So, yeah, you can't read too much into Leicester's. Where would they be now if they had them? Goodness knows where. They just happened to step into the job and did a good job at it. You never know, there could have been good permanent ones, but I don't think that was ever really intentionally planned. Interestingly, um, Tottenham's is Tim Sherwood, who I think was actually quite a good manager. Some would disagree, but I don't think he was too bad. Um, he started off as an assistant, as per usual, under Harry Radnap. Um, he then became technical director in 2012 and led the under-21 side to be uh, first under-21 Premier League season guiding the side to finish the top in both the group and elite stages. Uh, he did lose the league final to 3-2 to Manchester United. He would, um, as when Andre villas Borsas left as a manager, he became manager, I believe. He lost his first game against West Ham in the Capital One Cup, which I think... Is the same as the EFL Cup days. He then went on to manage 
um, a win over Southampton Premier League. But he, they, I think he then got actually an 18-month contract. So his last match as a Spurs manager was a win over Aston Villa. And they managed to achieve sixth place finish with a total of 69 points. He was sacked by Daniel Levy on the 13th of May 2014 and went on to Aston Villa. So, again, I don't think he did too badly. He did what he needed to do. He clearly deserved to get the permanent. Um, I don't think Wolverhampton would be as good. Um, they had Rob Edwards. Again, I, I don't know which Rob Edwards it is. Um, yeah, it is the one I've got here. Okay. Um, he was only interim manager. Um, he was an under 18s coach at Wolves, and his first season in charge was considered to be very successful. We uh, helped. Uh, promote head coaches Kenny Jagleet in for the final two months of the season and then became first team coach in the summer of 2015. He then became interim head coach following the sacking of Walter Zenger. He took charge for only two games a 1 0 draw at Blackburn and a 3 2 defeat against the Derby before Paul Lambert took charge. So, again, you can't really go too far into depth it's interim as per usual um i'm gonna briefly explain Mikel arteta because i think most people know his first season in charge this season he managed to guide them to win the fa cup the fa community shield and an eighth place finish so make what you want arsenal fans would probably say stick with him i think for now i would also agree um but I'm not going to go too much into depth for that. Chris Morgan would be in charge of Sheffield uh, United. And um, how do I explain Chris Morgan? Um, he was a caretaker manager uh, twice with um, um, Sheffield United, becoming reserve team coach after he had a serious knee injury he was still a registered player but unable to play due to injury so he did lead the united reserve to the central league title he was then appointed as caretaker manager for the remainder of the 2012-13 season after danny wilson got sacked and united did win the first game with morgan in charge but they didn't really significantly improve and did fail to clinch promotion, losing to Yeovil Town in the semi-final of the league on playoffs. Despite the fact he wanted it on a permanent basis, he was overlooked by David Weir of Scotland. And but he again left on the 11th of October. Again, Morgan resumed as caretaker manager. Um, he then worked as first team coach under Nigel Clough before going on to coach the under-21 side after Nigel Adkins took charge in the summer 2015. He then got released and went to Port Vale, or, yeah, I think it was Port Vale, which he went to after that. Oh, no, he went to Chesterfield as first team coach, and then Port Vale. He's never really been a permanent manager yet. Burnley, very interesting. You'll know him more famously for... Um, pundit, really, Chris Waddle. <laughs> Interesting enough, uh, I think he's on BBC Radio Five or something. But um, yeah, most people will know him more of being that. Um, he was a player manager at Burnley, and that's all. Moving Ruka Park actually in on a few transfer. He did have a bit of a disappointing season, to be fair. Only just avoiding relegation at the end of the season. He scored once during his spell at Burnley uh, when he drew two all with Bournemouth. But again, a player manager. Um, and then he never managed again. So I, I, it must have not worked out for him. He did become a pundit, which I think he's a bit better at. I think we can all agree. Stuart Gray, um, the both Southampton fans. Um, I. 
again what um sorry i just trying to find myself from my notes <laughs> it was a long time ago he is now 60 so um after his player career finished he joined the f- coaching staff at the dell before moving to Wolverhampton Wanderers in 1994 as reserve team coach. His family were unable to settle in the West Midlands at the time, so returned Southampton, initially working in the community office before becoming reserve team coach on Dave Jones in July 1997, before he moved up to the first team coach in 1998. He retained that after the appointment of Glenn Hoddle as manager in January 2000, but Hoddle left Tottenham in 2001, so he took over as caretaker manager before becoming permanent in June when they Southampton moved to their modern stadium, St Mary's. Um, the early results were poor and the chairman, Rupert Lowe, panicked about the effect of a club's investment in the new stadium. So he was sacked after only three months. Could argue was it deserved or not. He was replaced by Gordon Strachan. During his brief tenure as manager, he did break Southampton's transfer record at the time by signing Rory, De- De- Rory Delop for a fee of around £4 million. This was, of course, 2001, so of course it's a bit higher since then. Everton was Dave Watson. Uh, I might be going a bit too slowly for you guys. Um, oh, where is it? Where did my notes go? Uh, sorry, I've just got this like whole sort of thing I've been talking through and stuff, and it's really confusing how I've organised the notes and stuff. Um, but he was appointed Everton manager in March 1997 for the remainder of the 1996-97 season, following the resignation of Joe Royal but reverted to his playing duties in 1997 when Howard Kendall was appointed manager for the third and final time. Um, is yeah, He basically dropped out of the first team and then retired at the age of 39. Um, that was pretty much all we have. He then did become manager of Tranmere Rovers. I don't know how successful he was then, but as it's only the first one, that's there. Um, I don't think Newcastle fans really like John Carver. Um, but that's who he started. He was the, uh, actually the assistant to Bobby Robson at Newcastle. But Bobby Robson was sacked in August 2004. He was then appointed caretaker manager. He did win 3 0 against Blackburn. Um, but he dedicated that win to Robson. Uh, he was not actually considered for a permanent job. Uh, that went to Graham Sooness, who opted to bring in his own backroom staff. And he left the club in September 2004. So, again, not really that long. He did become caretaker manager again, again though. Um, so, yeah, he did again. You know, came back 2014-15, But Every time caretaker interim, he was never appointed permanent manager. Crystal Palace was Curtis Fleming. Uh, just catch my breath a bit. Um, again, he started off as assistant and became caretaker. Often is the case. Um, what can I really tell you about him? He just he joined in two, July 2011 when it was managed by um, former teammate of his, Dougie Friedman. He became development clo- coach and then he became first team coach at Crystal Palace. Uh, but moved on four months later to join Friedman as a similar role in Bolton Wanderers. I don't even know if, if he only really permanent time he became like proper manager as such was now where he, he is currently Punjab FC as manager of I think it's somewhere in India 
The next one I think is quite harsh. Um, they sacked this man, and I don't think they should have. A bit dubious about it. It's Brighton and Hove's Gus Poyet. But again, um, he was he came in at League One at the time and had a one and a half year contract. Um, his assistant was Mauricio Tarico, and he steered the club to safety. Um, he actually went and won three one against Southampton. He brought in Gordon Greer, Radost in Kishinet, Kish, Kishin, Chef, uh, Liam Bridcut, Matt Sparrow, Casper Ankergun, and Ashley Barnes. Uh, he also signed a four year contract. He started with five wins out of eight games, which actually put Brighton on top of League One. And um, he started the year 2011 with a 5-0 win on New Year's game against Le- Leighton Orient. He also had eight straight league victories in March. Uh, so he was 13 points clear at the top, with the games in hands of all closest rivals, apart from Southampton. Um, he secured promotion to the Championship, clinching a 4-3 home win over Dagenham and Redbridge with Ashley Boyle scoring of the winner in the 63rd minute. So the League One title was later on clinched on the 16th of April 2011, as they beat Warsaw 3-1, having been top without slipping since the eighth game of the season, and with four games left to play. He was the league manager of the season, um, even though it was only his first full season as a manager. It's quite interesting. He then broke the record transfer fee by signing Will Buckley and Craig Michael Smith and also brought in former Spain and Valencia playmaker Vincent on a free transfer. He signed unbeaten in the 2011-12 season and became championship manager of the month in August 2011. Uh, he signed a new five-year contract to remain at the club until 2016. In March 2012, he won the Outstanding Manager Achievement Award at the Football League Awards in League, beating Crystal Palace manager Dougie Freeman and former Huddersfield town boss Lee Clark. Uh, however, on the 23rd of June, Brighton released an official statement declaring that Poyet had been informed that his employment had been terminated with immediate effect. And he was only made aware of his sacking when a member of the BBC production staff handed him a printout of a club statement while working as a pundit for BBC Free's coverage of Spain versus Nigeria in the game of the FIFA Confederations Cup. I think that's incredibly dubious, if you ask me. I don't know why he was sacked. I'd love to know your opinions, Brighton. And I'd actually love to know why. So West Ham... Yes, I've not forgotten about you. It's all right. (laughs) This is going to be a long video. I can already tell. Um, He did have 20 ones. Um, It was reported that he had been interviewed in Rome for the vacant West Ham United job in the 7th of September 2008. He did impress the club's representatives at the interview and signed a three-year contract with West Ham, replacing Alan Kerbishley who resigned following differences with the board. He was availed as manager on the 11th of September, despite not having the UEFA managing licence. A uh, bit dubious again. But um, he's also a bit dubious because he played for the rivals of West Ham, Chelsea. So, But he did gain backing from the fans uh, and also received applause from Chelsea when he became came to Stamford Bridge as the manager. He did have a bit of a shaky start, but he did develop a side with a flair not seen in West Ham for some years, I believe. Um, he also brought in some new products like Junior Stanislas, Zavon Hines, who were given debuts. The duo and first-team youngsters Jack Collison, Collison and James Tompkins all scored their first goals during his tenure. And he signed a contract in April 2009, which kept him at Upton Park in 2013. But they did struggle in 2009 and 10 season. And his position as manager was put in doubt. Um, 
when he revealed he had not been consulted over a bid for West Brom Albion's player Graham Dorans and chairman and by chairman David Sullivan's announcement that the entire quad was for sale except for midfielder Scott Parker. West Ham then finished 17th, only five points of relegation places. Two days at, on the 11th of May 2010, two days after the end of the season, uh, his contract was terminated with immediate effect with Avram Grant as his successor. And there was a compensation settlement, but I still think it was, it was kind of deserved in a way if results not going your way. It would be interesting to see. Um, the club which is dead, or the manager which is dead, and therefore in this world would make the club dead, is Aston Villa. Ironically, it was during the time which I think they won the Champions League, was the last time their manager was their first one. So, get a manager, please, which isn't Dean Smith, Aston Villa, which is relatively inexperienced, if you want to make it onto this list. Um Leeds is Gwyn Williams. I have no idea how he pronounces that. I'm rubbish at Welsh. I presume that's what it is. Um, yeah. Um, he was former technical director and former Ch Chelsea's chief scout who discovered John Terry. Um, but really, he was more known as a scout. He did took time to took charge as the first team manager they faced Southend United when the manager of Dennis Wise resigned. He then, uh, when Gary McAllister came in, he returned as technical director. Um, and now he continues to use his contacts to help Leeds. Um, he did find Robert Snodgrass in Scotland and Louis Carno Beccio. Um, he was dismissed from these actually in 2013. But um, it's interesting. You don't normally appoint your chief scout as a manager. So that's something I was extremely astonished by. West Brom's is James Shan. I know. James Shan. He was manager of the under 23s to begin with. Um, he had a very good win for 58.33%, so he did do clearly a very good job. Um, but yeah, he um, he started as a coaching at Birmingham City, uh, helping the academy. He then joined the coaching staff of West Brom, uh, working with the club's under-7s, and then became manager of under-18s, under-21s, under-23s before becoming first team coaching staff in the 2017-18 season and was actually appointed caretaker manager in March 2019 when Darren Moore got sacked. Uh, he did actually manage to win 3 0 over Swansea City in his first game in charge and he remained as caretaker manager until the end of the 2018-19 season on the 28th of June 2019. He is at. He then went on to become interim manager, Kinmont Harriers, and he is actually currently a manager at Solihull Moors. Clearly, a fan of the Midlands, as you can tell. The final one is Fulham's current manager, Scott Parker, who we all know got them promoted from uh, the Championship by the playoffs. Too soon, some would argue. I'm not going to argue with that, but um, he he was appointed as caretaker manager, to be fair, when Claudio Ranieri was dismissed when the team was 19th in the Premier League. He did lose his first game against Chelsea, but did win three out of his, lap, his six... Um, he won three, lost six out of his first nine games in charge and were relegated for the championship. But he was appointed on a permanent two-year contract uh, on the 10th of May 2019. And in his first full session as a manager of the club, he actually managed to finish fourth place and get promoted. So clearly done very well as a manager with a win percentage of 46.8%. I really hope you enjoyed that video. I won.
I don't know whether you'd be interested in me doing further long ones or trying to keep it short. Um, but goodbye for now. I think I need a bit of a break.